Hey, welcome everyone. I want to appreciate your you taking time to attend this CLE, this uh, webinar. If you're not an attorney, just hang with us and we'll get started in just a minute. We'll let folks filter in. Thanks for coming. Hi everyone, as you're arriving, uh, just understand your cameras are off, your audio is off. Uh, not gonna be asking you to come off mute or audio or mute or video, but we'll get started here in about uh, 30 seconds. Just let a few more stragglers come in. During the course of this presentation, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box that's available on your menu. You can also use the chat function. We, we will have team members from our end monitoring both of those. I uh, will attempt to answer uh, questions as we can during the presentation uh, behind the scenes. And then uh, we'll have a Q&A portion at the end for anyone that's, that's interested or has a question uh, related to things. For those who are seeking CLE credit from the state of Illinois, uh, we'll be sending out a, a, a post-event uh, form. It will we'll collect your information and make sure that all that is squared away. There's no fee for the uh, continuing legal education credit. If you're in the audience and you're not from, uh, you're not seeking credit from Illinois, if you're seeking credit from another jurisdiction, uh, please let us know. Reach out to us. Our contact information will be on the back end of this presentation, and we're happy to help you facilitate that. We have a, a very good track record here at National Headquarters of uh, having our programming accepted for CLE across the country. Uh, and uh, we're happy to help you facilitate that certificate or letter of attendance, whatever you need uh, for your own jurisdiction. Uh, for those of you in New York, uh, New York bar members who may be here, uh, we have not heard back from the bar there about the uh, acceptance of this program. We expect that it will be uh, accepted, uh, but and we are an accredited CLE provider in the state of New York, uh, but we just don't have that confirmation yet. So please keep in touch with us. We want to make sure you get this hour of credit. Without further ado, I want to welcome you to our IHL primer series. This primer series is brand new this year, and this is the first of the primer series that we're actually offering for continuing legal education credit. You don't have to be a lawyer to get something out of this presentation, but this will be a roughly quarterly event from the NHQ side where we provide these building block IHL classes uh, to not only increase your knowledge of IHL and how it functions in, in our world and in conflicts, but it, uh, for those volunteers, for those of you who are involved in Red Cross IHL programs out across the country, this provides a good toolkit opportunity for you to use a class like this in your own efforts. So on behalf of the Red Cross, welcome. I wanna start by a uh, with a brief thought exercise. I'm gonna give you some, some uh, basic facts about the photo you see here. I don't want you to, to you don't need to put anything uh, on audio, you're, you're muted right now. Feel free to put into the chat uh, answers to the, the question that I'll ask you in a second here. But what you're seeing here is a building that's just been hit by an artillery strike, a Russian artillery strike in uh, Eastern Ukraine. This photo uh, is as of uh, late November, of 2022, so it's very recent. Uh, uh, first responders are on the ground attending uh, to the, the fallout from this, uh, this strike. Uh, we do know that there are casualties uh, on ground there, including uh, several children. Uh, we also know that uh, this was an apartment building of some sorts. There were folks living here uh, at the time of the strike. And uh, that's, that's about all we know now, that the first responders are collecting uh, further information attending to, to the wounded uh, and whatnot. I want you to think, uh, and you, you happy to, to have you put this in the chat. Uh, those who are watching on recording will just need to, to mull this one over. But what other, I, I want you to ruminate for just a second on the knee-jerk reaction you had to some of those facts. Uh, me naming countries that were involved, location, date, the fact that children were apparently injured in this strike, possibly killed, the fact that these were apartments. Think about where your brain 
uh, snapped to uh, as, as those words came out of my mouth. Now, with that in mind, think what other questions would you want to know about? Uh, there are many who are watching this, who are in the audience, who are attorneys. Uh, some of you are litigators. Uh, you're, you're used to uh, trying cases in court, uh, operating in the well. What pieces of evidence, what critical pieces of information do you not have right now, but that you would want? You don't have to be an attorney to be thinking critically about this as well. Are you curious about who was in the building? Are you curious about where specifically this building was sitting? Are you curious about the circumstances of, of that strike? Uh, what was going on uh, on the end of, uh, in this case, the, uh, the Russian party that, that fired the artillery shot? Think about those questions. We're going to come back to this, this thought exercise in a minute, but I want to get your brains uh, in gear, warmed up, and thinking about the sort of things that are in play when we talk about some of these foundational building block elements of IHL throughout the course of this. My name is Thomas Harper. I am the, a senior counsel with the Red Cross uh, uh, Office of General Counsel at National Headquarters. I'm also the senior legal advisor for the IHL program at National Headquarters. I'm joined by two absolutely fantastic professionals, Christian Jorgensen, who may be answering some of your questions throughout the, the course of this presentation. He's our, our legal advisor in IHL. He's a, a counsel for the Office of General Counsel as well, and heads up our IHL dissemination program, our adult-focused programming. Larissa Hatch uh, is our program officer who uh, intrepidly leads the Youth Action Pro uh, Campaign Program for uh, our IHL program. She's not an attorney, which I think all of us who are uh, have our law licenses on this call can agree was a really, really great life decision. We could go back in time and maybe learn from her uh, and uh, avoid some of that suffering from law school. But the three of us work together. We are very, very small cogs in a much bigger program that operates to uh, carry out the mission of disseminating IHL to the American public. That mission, that educational piece is a core obligation of the United States and of other national society or other countries uh, who are high contracting parties to the Geneva Conventions across the globe. The idea is that high contracting parties, which is just about everybody these days uh, who, who is signed on to, to Geneva, they have an obligation to go out and educate their, their respective publics about IHL. The idea behind that dissemination requirement and, and the, the uniform uh, thought process amongst the drafters of Geneva, all four of the conventions and, and their additional protocols, was that really the legitimacy uh, and, and the importance of these rules hinge on the public's knowledge of them and their understanding of them. So a public that is uninformed, that's unaware that IHL exists, what it serves to protect, how it serves to operate in armed conflict and, and the, the things that it does in that space is a public that is really unable to appreciate its importance, a public that's unable to advocate uh, to, to their elected uh, leaders for its respect and enforcement. And likewise, a public that is educated about this, that knows about IHL, that understands the protections that it offers, that's a public who is empowered to demand from their elected leaders, from their military, that these rules are respected, that this core foundational piece of international law, of the rule of law as, as a global society is respected during armed conflict uh, to, to achieve the, the purpose of reducing suffering. We also serve a role in movement relations within the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. And uh, we work in a, a variety of ways to advance the cause of IHL uh, outside of just pure dissemination. I want to talk for just a second about the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. For those of you who have volunteered, staff members of the Red Cross uh, or, or uh, Red Crossers in other capacities who are on this call, you're going to know this very intimately. But the Red Cross has an intrinsic relationship with IHL and, and on the battlefield. And so it's important to understand this as a baseline. The Red Cross movement is unified, but it's comprised of three main bodies. The International Committee of the Red Cross, known as the Guardians of IHL, they're based out of Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, they serve a battlefield role in, uh, the, in ensuring the respect of IHL during armed conflicts. 
Uh, they, they obviously operate in a variety of capacities outside the battlefield, but they provide uh, that very unique, very critical role uh, in the context of armed conflicts. In the middle bucket there, you have the 192 national societies of the, of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, of which the American Red Cross is one of them. There are only a very small handful, three or four countries in the nation, very small countries that don't have a national society. It is a rich, diverse group of humanitarians across the globe working uh, in conjunction with these other two arms, the ICRC and the IFRC, uh, to reduce suffering worldwide. The movement as a whole exists to reduce human suffering. It's not to reduce American suffering or British suffering, Australian suffering. It is a humanitarian movement that crosses borders, that crosses ethnicities and backgrounds uh, to, to, to meet the need wherever it is. And then lastly, you have the IFRC, which plays a critical uh, coordination role when it comes to, to emergencies, disasters, uh, certain things like that. They, they help coordinate uh, and, and ensure that uh, aid is delivered or, or needs are met in an efficient way and that the, uh, those elements of the Red Cross movement who are, are involved in those responses are working together seamlessly and in concert. The movement as a whole operates on and rests on seven fundamental humanitarian principles. And I wanna highlight for purposes of IHL, uh, those of neutrality, impartiality, and, uh, and independence. So uh, whether it's the American Red Cross or any other national society or the ICRC, the IFRC, we're independent from the countries that we may sit in. The American Red Cross doesn't take orders from the American government any more than the ICRC takes its takes any orders from the Swiss government uh, as they sit in Geneva there. Uh, that independence is critical. We have to be able to function independently uh, with, without uh, being completely beholden to a, a state government because it feeds directly into that neutrality and that impartiality that is so essential to, to the work that is done and particularly in the context of armed conflicts. As a movement, including national societies like the American Red Cross. We are impartial. We are neutral. We don't take sides uh, in a disaster. We don't take sides in an armed conflict. So in a place like Ukraine, uh, the, whether it's the ICRC, the American Red Cross, the Ukrainian Red Cross, they're not taking sides. Who's right and who's wrong? Who's at fault and who's not at fault uh, in things? We are responding to a, need, uh, a series of needs that, are, that exist, uh, suffering that exists, and we're attempting to meet that need and reduce that suffering. You can uh, easily imagine why something like impartiality and neutrality is so critical, especially for an organization like the ICRC on the battlefield. You can imagine that in a, a scenario like a detention visit, uh, visiting a, a prisoner of war camp, uh, the business of being an impartial, neutral player in this space is very critical. Uh, it, it allows them to, to help facilitate access uh, to those who are detained there, and, and helps from uh, the sort of finger pointing and suspicions that might otherwise prevent that humanitarian aid from that help from being delivered. So these are fundamental absolute principles that, that we abide by. IHL, I, I wanna start with what is it? Uh, there, there are a number of names for it, law of armed conflict, law of war. IHL as a body, as a component of international law is in a nutshell, what you see on the screen here, a set of rules that seeks to limit the destructive effects of armed conflict. For ages prior to, to the advance or the, the adoption and, and the evolution of IHL, warfare was, was categorized by just unchecked destruction and unchecked suffering. On the battlefield of Solferino in Italy in 1859, uh, Henry Dunant witnessed that, uh, the, the, the founder of the ICRC and, and uh, the, the sort of father figure to the entire Red Cross, Red Crescent movement witnessed this sort of unchecked destruction firsthand. He went back and wrote a book called uh, book, uh, the, the Memory of Solferino and his experience there, which was shared by many who had observed or participated in, in wars uh, in the past, was that this can't be the way that wars are fought on into the future, that while armed conflict may never be stopped, that may be an aspirational goal, that it can't continue to be, wars can't continue to be fought, gloves off with no rules and unchecked suffering. And so IHL as a body of law developed 
to try to rein in that destruction, rein in that suffering, and protect as best as possible those innocent, those that are caught in the middle of an armed conflict, but are innocent in terms of uh, not being a combatant, not, not being a part of, of that war. So IHL as a body of law is comprised of two main components. On one hand, you have your international treaty law. Think uh, another, another way to think about that, your Geneva law, your Hague law, referring to the Geneva Conventions and Hague Convention. Those are our traditional treaties. That's, that's sort of where your brain goes to when you think of a law. You think of, uh, especially for the lawyers in the, in the audience here, think of a case book, statutes, the US code sitting on a, a bookshelf. That's probably less of a thing now. It's, it's all digitized and, and uh, we've, we've moved away from, from those card copies. But these international treaties are, are uh, instances where states have come together, nations have come together and establish formal legally binding agreements between parties. Now, on the other hand, you have what, what is known as customary international law, a set of customary rules. Now, at its core there, the word custom, these are, are uh, rules that are established by practice, by observance. So in conflict after conflict, there are certain rules that, that nations, that parties to those armed conflicts have observed repeatedly, and that the weight of that repeated observance uh, renders them custom. And it's important to note that even though these might not be uh, you know, formalized in the same way that, that a, the Geneva Conventions might be, countries getting together and signing documents, as you see in that top left picture there, they share uh, acceptance as binding law. So they are treated just the same as, as the rules that might flow from uh, the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Conventions themselves, it's important to, to just do a quick overview of what they are. It is, it is more than, uh, so if you hear somebody say the Geneva Convention, really what we're talking about are, are a series of, of these conventions. The first, uh, the first Geneva Convention is intended or designed to protect the wounded and the sick uh, on land, soldiers on the battlefield. This came directly out of Henry Dunant's experience at Solferino. It led ultimately to the push for the first Geneva Convention, something that Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross, joined in to try to get the uh, American government to sign on to. Uh, uh, it is the foundational uh, document of, of the conventions. The second, third, and fourth Geneva Conventions followed World War II. The second, protecting uh, personnel at sea, military personnel at sea. The third, for, uh, setting down protections for prisoners of war. The fourth, offering protections to <clears throat> excuse me, civilians, including those in occupied territories. <clears throat> and then in the 1970s uh, and uh, moving forward into the uh, 1990s, early 2000s, you had three additional protocols, AP1, AP2, and AP3, as they're known uh, by their shorthand. So these, uh, that, that body there comprises Geneva Conventions. That's separate and, and apart from the Hague Convention, separate and apart from customary international law. But this gives you a good snapshot of uh, sort of a core foundational document and, and a core piece of that treaty law that comprises IHL. Another question for the group. This is not one that we're going to ask for. You can be brave and answer it in the chat if you'd like. You can uh, just think about it if, if you'd rather keep it to yourself. But I want you to think about the question that's on the screen here. Presume that the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the one that, that kicked off in, in February of 2022, I, I'm setting aside uh, the, the Crimea uh, dating back to 2014, but in February 2022, presume that that invasion is unlawful under international law, illegal invasion. Based on that illegality, select the most appropriate of uh, the, the three options on the screen here. A, Russian forces uh, combat actions are, are lawful per se. So they're automatically lawful, unlawful because the invasion is unlawful. B, Russian forces actions in combat may be unlawful, depending on how they're conducted. And C, you, you need some extra coffee. Uh, it's afternoon uh, here on the East Coast. Uh, you, you need to wake up. That's, that's completely fair. That's a very lawyer answer. The answer is actually B. Uh, and the reason for that, so B was, uh, it, it, they may be unlawful. It just depends on, on how they're, they're conducted. 
that goes to the difference in two key bodies of law in this area that of the question of legality of going to war use of force between nations or between a nation and another armed group and the business of how war is fought the legality of how war is fought once it kicks off ihl as a body of law is going to focus in on that second that latter part how war is fought the means and the methods of warfare it's still connected with the legality of going to war so to call back on on my high school latin which has got a, a ton of rust on it but uh legality of going to war that's known as uh, use ad bellum and then the legality of going uh, how war is fought once armed conflict has kicked off that's use in bello that's the the latin terms that you'll see tossed around for these two areas of law the important point here is that they are separate. They're related, obviously, both deal with warfare, armed conflict, uh, but one doesn't flow into the other. By that, I mean the, the, the legality or lack thereof of an armed conflict, Ukraine is a great example, doesn't automatically uh, adjudge anything about how the war is fought in terms of individual battles, actions of soldiers, commanders, et cetera, in that armed conflict. So in the case of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, the, the possible illegality of uh, that war, I'm not here to litigate that, that question, but even if that war is determined to be illegal uh, under USAD bellum, that doesn't automatically mean that every action of a Russian soldier in Ukraine during this armed conflict is therefore illegal. It doesn't flow uh, like an if-then proposition that... So we're going to focus on means and methods and how wars are fought, how IHL operates to, to go there. But before we do that, I have to touch on the business of uh, armed conflicts as a whole, because they are not all created equally. They're all destructive. Uh, they all involve some amount of suffering. But the law actually differs in how it sees uh, armed conflicts. Classically, you have on one side what are known as international armed conflicts. Those are conflicts involving two states, uh, two nations uh, at war. Think World War I, World War II, uh, the sort of classical international armed conflict. The current Ukraine conflict uh, against Russia, that is an international armed conflict. Two states, uh, regardless of how the, the states are categorizing or discussing or describing their involvement, regardless of the fact that there may not be a declaration of war, it is still an international armed conflict because one state has used force against another. On the other hand, you have non-international armed conflict. Those are non-international armed conflicts or NIACs. Those are typically uh, internal struggles. So think a, a civil war of sorts. The American Civil War is a great example of something that would today uh, very likely qualify as a NIAC under, under the legal framework. There is a, a whole host of, of factors, legal factors involved in assessing whether a non-international armed conflict is in existence. It doesn't touch, uh, a NIAC isn't triggered every time uh, for you know, an isolated terrorist attack or an isolated use of force happens. Uh, there are questions of intensity, uh, duration of the armed conflict. There are questions about the non-state armed group or groups that are involved, their level of organization. There's a whole uh, host of factors that, that uh, are involved in, in uh, determining whether a NIAC has been triggered. The difference and the reason why I highlight this here, uh, IACs and NIACs, international and non-international armed conflicts, is because each body, each type of armed conflict triggers a different set of IHL. By that I mean, in an international armed conflict, you're going to trigger the full complement of IHL, the treaty law, the customary international law, et cetera. Uh, the full body, this is the, the classical armed conflict that, that we think about when we, we hear the term war. Full body of IHL is triggered under an IAC. A NIAC only triggers a portion of those rules. And that's really critical because the, uh, the fact that a NIAC triggers a smaller scope of IHL when one happens means that there are differing protections for those on the battlefield. There are differing protections for uh, folks like uh, those detained during the armed conflict, there are different uh, protections for uh, 
folks like civilians and, and others that, that may be operating around the battlefield. So it's really important that you, as a starting point, you consider the classification, the type of armed conflict that you're in. Our focus from here until uh, the end of the, the presentation is gonna be on four fundamental principles of IHL. If you know nothing about other, nothing about IHL other than having a basic understanding of these four fundamental principles, you're going to be in pretty good shape. You're going to be in good shape to understand uh, current events, future events that are unfolding across the globe. You're going to be able to better understand the importance of these protections. And I would submit to you uh, the vast majority of uh, news stories of incidents that, that come across uh, your, your, your table, your phone, your iPad, uh, your computer in your daily life uh, here in America concern or relate back to these four fundamental principles. So uh, walk away with these four and, and also that understanding of what IHL is broadly, and you're going to be in really, really good shape. And, and this is sort of what our, exactly what our program exists to do. IHL as a whole exists uh, as a balancing of the scales. Uh, so before we get into any specific principles, it's important to understand that IHL doesn't operate uh, as an if then. It doesn't operate to outlaw every civilian casualty, to outlaw every uh, bit of destruction or damage to civilian property. Instead, on one hand, uh, IHL seeks to protect and preserve humanity, reduce that suffering, protect the innocent during armed conflict. IHL recognizes as a body of law that during armed conflicts, there are, there's going to be a certain amount of military force, death, destruction, that results from it, that is necessary. Uh, wars are fought to be won or lost, and in doing so, uh, things are going to get broken, people are going to get hurt or killed. IHL is not ignorant or blind uh, to that fact. What IHL operates to do is to, be as best as it can, balance those scales. And so that when force is used, it's used in a constrained method, enough to, to get the job done, to accomplish the mission, but not enough or not so much that uh, you're, you're crossing into the boundary of needless destruction, needless death, unchecked use of force uh, that, that without regard to humanity. So it attempts to balance that scale and it's not perfect. No body of the law is, but that's what it operates to, to do. It's the fulcrum. So the first of the four print fundamental principles we're gonna cover is military necessity. You see the basic rule there. Military force must be used to achieve a legitimate military purpose. Military necessity is a gateway principle. By that, I mean, if you don't have military necessity for an operation for a use of force, you don't get to any of the other principles. A military operation, use of force, it must be militarily necessary before you can go forward to any other analysis. So if we were to break this down into a flow chart, military necessity being here, if your answer is no, you don't have it, that's the end of the flow chart. You cannot use force. Any other force beyond that point uh, in, in that context uh, would be unlawful. It would be a violation of, of IHL. Uh, so let's explore that. Necessity is, is built on uh, two bedrocks. One is the need for a justification, a justification to use force. And the second is a set of limits on that use of force with that justification in mind. So military force has to be used only to achieve a legitimate battlefield purpose. Attorneys on the call, I am, I'm gonna speak your language here and, and sort of say the, the quiet part out loud about our existence in society. We are nothing if not really great at creating terms and phrases that are like nesting dolls that require our expertise, so to speak, to, to further define things. Uh, we like to daisy chain these things together. It, it has helped our profession perpetuate itself in society. But here, when we talk about a legitimate battlefield purpose and your, your mind says, well, what is a legitimate battlefield purpose? We're talking about legitimate military objectives. Military objective, that's a term that, that we hear all the time, what is a legitimate? Well, let's think about uh, these two images here. On the top left, you have 
a BMP fighting vehicle. It's marked with the Russian Z. That's uh, it, it's it's uh, very uh, signatory of Russia's efforts in Ukraine. This is uh, this vehicle is sort of the core of uh, Russian armor. Uh, the, the, these uh, fighting uh, these battalions that they're using across Ukraine. And then on the bottom right there is the Su-27 fighter jet, a mainstay of the Ukrainian Air Force. Well, what about these vehicles might make them legitimate military targets? Well, they're machines of war, right? One's a, a, a light tank, a, a, uh, an armored vehicle. The other is a fighter jet. These vehicles are built to destroy the enemy, to engage in warfare. By their very nature, some objects are legitimate military targets. So the fact that you have these two, two uh, uh, vehicles here that are built purpose-built for fighting, that makes them a legitimate military target. That's not, uh, you can't stretch that into everything. So if you're in California and you're on uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's property and you see his um, huge collection of tanks that he rides around in and smokes cigars and, and drinks whiskey, that tank is probably serving a different purpose there. But it's a good starting point to say if something, something by its very nature can be a legitimate military target. What about these three bridges on the right side? They're, they're all civilian in nature. That middle bridge, you see a, uh, a passenger train going by. You see civilian traffic, cars, trucks going about their daily business. It, they appear to be in civilian areas. What about these might make them a legitimate military target? Well, let me color a little bit of background for these bridges. These are the three, th these are pre-war pictures in Ukraine. These are three uh, of the larger bridges in and out of Kyiv, uh, the capital city. What about in the context of the current war might make those legitimate military targets? Well, that location there is important. So these three bridges are situated as in and out points for the capital city of the country. In the early part of the war, that capital city was a big target, a big mission objective for Russian forces. Ukrainians actually destroyed uh, these bridges or heavily damaged them to to deny Russian forces the ability to advance into the city with ease, uh, to, to restrict their movement to certain other areas. So this is a great example of why an object, these are civilian objects, there's no, there, no doubt about it, there, there's, uh, there's no gray area, there. but things by their location can be legitimate military targets or can become legitimate military targets and feed or create your military necessity. What about this vehicle? This is just a nice luxury convertible, uh, nothing at all uh, military about this thing. Uh, it, it's just driving down the road, uh, just a nice street, doesn't appear to be in an armed conflict. Well, what if I showed you uh, these images? So a heavy machine gun strapped to the back or bolted to the back of this same convertible. These are images from the early days of the conflict, uh, just before the invasion kicked off. And these enterprising, Ukrainians uh, bolted this to the back of their car. Imagine that they're using this, this car, driving around and engaging Russian forces with that machine gun on the back. Well, now you've taken a civilian object and by its use, namely creating a, 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 a technical, for lack of a better term, a vehicle with a, a gun strap to it, uh, you, you, have, you are using it in a way that makes it or transforms it into a legitimate military target potentially. So objects, some objects by their use uh, can feed that military necessity. So that's justification. You have to have that justification. It's fed by an analysis of what it is you're targeting, what it is you're trying to use force against. That justification is bounded by a set of limits. And by that, I mean, you cannot use uh, necessity to justify actions that are otherwise unlawful or outside the bounds of IHL. So the image here uh, is a tragic uh, massacre at Malmody. It is 1944 uh, on the back end of the Battle of the Bulge. As Allied forces broke through German lines, uh, there was a, an Allied, a US convoy, a logistics convoy, uh, trying to work to resupply Allied forces. German forces, Nazi forces were rapidly retreating. This logistics convoy got lost, got turned around and ended up in an, in a, an SS Panzer unit's hands. They were captured. As the SS was uh, retreating, they, their commander decided that uh, they couldn't take these prisoners with them, executed all 80 or so of them and left them 
in the snow where they were found by Allied forces a short time later. At the trial uh, of the SS commander at Nuremberg after the, uh, after the war was over, necessity was attempted to be used as a defense. Uh, in other words, uh, the, the exigency of the circumstances created a necessity to kill these prisoners. Uh, they were American forces. We had to kill them uh, because we couldn't take them with us. I would have endangered uh, Nazi lives. That was roundly rejected. Uh, because of that limitation on necessity. You cannot use it to justify actions that are out of bounds with IHL. Uh, it, it can't be used to justify carte blanche use of force. So justification and limits make up necessity. Our second principle is that of uh, distinction. It's a basic rule, but one that, that uh, can be difficult to, to uh, and, and has layers uh, in practice. The basic rule you see on the screen here, parties to a conflict, uh, have to distinguish between civilians and combatants. So you can use force against combatants, not against civilians. Those are protected uh, persons. Also, you have to, all parties have to distinguish between military and civilian objects. So let's dig into uh, what that means. Combatants themselves carry an obligation to distinguish themselves from the civilian population when engaged in, in an attack. The U.S. Armed Forces uh, wear uniforms not just because uh, they, they look sharp or, or uh, need to distinguish ourselves as, as members of the Army. On the battlefield, they serve a critical purpose and, and have that legal connection to separate us from the civilian pop population that we're operating in. So when you see a U.S. soldier on the battlefield in uniform, that is an instant visual cue that that is a combatant and not a civilian. That's a critical obligation to, to help ensure that civilians are protected and don't needlessly come uh, within the line of fire. So think about this soldier, this Ukrainian soldier that's on the screen here. What about this soldier uh, might distinguish him, might allow you as a, as a combatant to know that, uh, that this is a fighter, that this is a combatant? Well, a few things. He's carrying arms openly. So he has that AK-47 hoisted high. He has a yellow armband, which in the context of the Ukrainian armed, conf uh, Ukrainian armed conflict is signatory of Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, it appears that that yellow armband is covering a unit patch, a military unit patch, which would signal his affiliation with the military. There's a flag on his left shoulder there. He appears to be in some semblance of a uniform. So you can look at him and without asking any questions, without needing any other intel, you can quickly assess and determine that this is probably a legitimate military target uh, because of its very nature. This is a soldier uh, for, uh, for a party to the armed conflict. You cannot target non-combatants. So I mentioned the business about civilians generally. Those in the general sense of the word not, or the phrase non-combatants, uh, they cannot be targeted. But specifically, non-combatants also refers to uh, folks, some folks in uniform with a specific status, a specific non-combatant status, namely medics and chaplains. Those are, are equal members of the military. A chaplain is no less a, a U.S. soldier than anybody else, but they don't serve a combat role. They don't serve an offensive military role. Neither do medics, even though they are out there operating on the battlefield. They're protected from direct intentional attack. You cannot target them, even though they're wearing uh, you know, the uniform. They do wear distinctive emblems. Uh, med military medics will wear the Red Cross, uh, and your chaplains will wear the insignia of the, the uh, religious sect that they affiliate with. That helps to, in some ways to, to distinguish them from actual combatants, other uniform combatants. Civilian objects is also a critical element of distinction. And I wanna highlight here the presumption. All objects are considered civilian unless they are distinctly military objectives. So think about the United States, a place like uh, Fort Hood, Texas, the, the biggest military base that we have uh, by land area in the United States. Uh, you think about a base like that, an airfield with their combat aviation brigade, helicopters on it, uh, maybe barracks and training grounds, those are, are, are pretty distinctly military objectives. There's not gray area there. But if you were to go off coast uh, into the town, uh, into Colleen, the, uh, the town that surrounds Fort Hood, uh, 
you're talking apartments, uh, fast food places, restaurants, shopping centers, uh, Walmarts, Targets, et cetera. Those are, even though they're in proximity there, those are presumed to be civilian objects unless uh, other factors shape that analysis. So the image here is a good example of this. That, that's a radio tower on the outskirts of Kiev in the middle of being struck uh, by a Russian missile. Uh, these radio towers would be considered civilian objects. These are TV towers, no different than the ones that we have here in the U.S. to help us uh, broadcast TV, internet signals, et cetera. Russian forces in the early part of the war uh, assessed that these towers were being used to assist uh, Ukrainian forces, Ukrainian armed forces, communicate and coordinate their military operations. And uh, that transitioned, in their eyes, uh, that from being a civilian object to a military object that took care of the distinction and its use uh, carried for that justification uh, that, that gave them necessity to strike those targets. Our third uh, principle here is that of proportionality. Proportionality is a balancing test that balances the uh, expected civilian casualties or the harm or death to civilians, damage, destruction of civilian property against the military advantage of an operation. So because of necessity, uh, you're not using force just to use force. You, you have an objective in mind uh, that gives you that necessity. The expected civilian casualties, the expected damage or destruction to that, uh, to that civilian property involved in that attack cannot be excessive in relation to the concrete military advantage gain. So in other words, having necessity doesn't give you, uh, or and having necessity, uh, checking the box on distinction doesn't give you a blank check to use any sort of force regardless of uh, the, the collateral damage. So you have to conduct that balancing test, and it has to be a concrete military advantage. This can't be speculative like, well, if we launch this artillery round into this apartment complex, we might hit a Ukrainian fighter or two. It, it needs to be concrete in nature, and that analysis has to be done uh, with any use of force. What proportionality is not is uh, a requirement that it be proportional response. And by that, I mean it doesn't require a party to the armed conflict to use matching force. So if somebody shoots at you with a pistol during an armed conflict, it doesn't mean that you can only shoot back at them with, with a pistol or another small arm. Uh, that's not what, what proportionality operates to do. The fourth of our principles here is that of unnecessary suffering. And what we're zoning or, or honing in on here with this principle is that the, the weapons and your tactics used in warfare has to comply with the principles of IHL. Uh, so just because you're in a, an armed conflict doesn't mean that you can use any old weapon or any old tactic that you'd like. And what this gets to is we want to limit superfluous in injury. We want to limit needless suffering, even of those uh, who are legitimate military targets. So the principle here at its core means that you can't use means or methods of warfare that are either designed or intended to cause unnecessary suffering or superfluous injury. So when we talk about a weapon designed to, to cause unnecessary suffering, think, of, think back to World War I, think of uh, the horrific chemical attacks that, that happened in that war, something like mustard gas uh, that was used to, to really uh, inflict a, a grievous amount of pain and suffering on uh, those, that, it was, uh, those that, that were hit by this gas. Uh, that is a weapon that is designed at its core to cause that unnecessary suffering and superfluous injury. Uh, it, it's just meant to make. Now, on the other hand, you can have a perfectly lawful weapon be used in a way that is intended to cause unnecessary suffering. So take an M16 assault rifle, that sort of the mainstay of the U.S. military. That weapon is lawful. There's nothing inherently illegal about that weapon. Uh, it is not designed to cause unnecessary suffering. However, there are a number of situations in which that weapon could be used in a way that would be calculated to cause unnecessary suffering. So if you had an individual firing an M16 and they were aiming at somebody's feet to shoot them in the feet and just cause them tremendous pain, uh, cause them to not be able to get away and, and repeatedly be shot there, uh, that is, a, that is using an otherwise lawful weapon in an unlawful manner because of the intent 
behind its use. So unnecessary suffering has that dual span. I mentioned the IHL balancing uh, act, uh, that, that fulcrum nature that it plays, but it's also important to realize that IHL as a body of law doesn't operate to outlaw uh, automatically every uh, sort of uh, bad thing that happens on the battlefield. IHL is, is sort of a realist area of law, uh, so to speak. It, it recognizes that a certain amount of death and destruction is going to happen. It also recognizes that there are a, a litany of reasons or, or uh, factors that impact decisions that result in uh, death and suffering on the battlefield and destruction. And those range from the fatigue and stress of, of military operations, you, you know, soldiers operating on, on little sleep, on extended operations, uh, working around the clock seven days a week uh, in fighting. It can involve time constraints, so an exigent situation where you, you need to rapidly make a decision. Maybe you're, you're manning a checkpoint and a, a military checkpoint and a vehicle is barreling towards you at a high rate of speed, ignoring warnings to stop. Incomplete information, uh, that, that can often crop up in, con in concert with those other two. You, you only have so much intelligence uh, before or leading into a particular decision. Uh, you, you never have the full picture of things. What those combine to, those and other factors, are uh, life and death. It, life and death for, for folks on both sides. Think about the, the instance of uh, the checkpoint that I mentioned. Uh, your decision to use force in that situation or not uh, has a life or death impact on the person or people in that car and on yourself as well. So uh, there are uh, weighty, weighty issues. IHL, in the context of all of this, judges uh, individuals and I alleged IHL violations in context. The, the evaluation of an IHL violation or, or you know, compliance with these rules is never, ever done in a vacuum. It's always done with an eye towards the circumstances at the time, what the individuals involved in the incident knew or didn't know, the factors that went in uh, to, to a particular decision to use force. I want to cycle back uh, to the thought exercise that we did at the beginning. Uh, I showed you uh, just a hypothetical example that wasn't uh, a, a real factual scenario and, and asked you to think about that apartment complex. Now I wanna talk a real case and, and uh, kind of tie some of the things that we've been talking about together. This image here, uh, some of you may or may not recognize that it, it's hard to tell from this image exactly what this is unless you're familiar with the scenario. Uh, I, I wanna take you to 2015 in June uh, to Kunduz province in Afghanistan. So this is the northern part of the country in the, the uh, black bordered uh, compound you see here is a Doctors Without Borders hospital, uh, hospital complex. You see the trauma center there. Its, it's office is, uh, is a field hospital that was uh, treating individuals uh, injured in, in that vicinity. That was on 21 June. Uh, and just a short time later, this is the overhead image after uh, a, a, an attack on the on this compound. You can see there that the trauma center is uh, is very badly damaged. Uh, the office there uh, sustained heavy damage as well. There are a number of individuals that were killed, including uh, Doctors Without Borders staff and doctors. So MSF, by the way, is the the uh, uh, the, the French language uh, uh, name for Doctors Without Borders. So uh, this trauma center was hit. And it was uh, struck by an American AC-130H Spectre gunship. So that it's, it's pictured there. The circumstances behind this, uh, this attack led to a lot of condemnations immediately in, in the immediate aftermath. I mean, this was, there were no, uh, to this date that I know of, there were no uh, Taliban or other insurgent fighters that were on site here. This, uh, this led to a, a, a lot of that, that sort of same anger uh, that, that still persists to this day, but a lot of that was, was very virulent right in the wake of this, uh, this incident. As the incident was investigated, as details were made available to the public, it was revealed that the, the Spectre gunship was called in in response to a, a, a NATO, a group of NATO soldiers who were taking fire from a building. So we mentioned buildings, uh, locations can, can become legitimate military targets. They were attempting to defend themselves, were calling in air support, 
and there was a uh, an Air Force soldier uh, or an Air Force airman rather on the ground there uh, who was being his, his job was to put a laser on the target to designate uh, the, the precise target for this gunship as, as it was being called in to support uh, the troops under fire. The laser was put on the wrong building. There was a cascading series of, of human errors that resulted in that, uh, that airman uh, putting the laser on the wrong building. Uh, the, the gunship hit the target that was, that was designated. Uh, it was just a catastrophic uh, mistake and, and one that, that cost a lot of lives. I'm not here in presenting this, this incident to, to offer any answers about this incident or any other. I present this because uh, oftentimes this, is, this is a great example and one that some open wounds about this uh, very understandably persist to this day, this incident. Um, but there, I, I use this to illustrate both that knee jerk and those additional factors, uh, that those things that I had to think about at the top. And uh, the importance of, of how IHL operates as a judgment, uh, how IHL judges or how IHL, alleged IHL violations are judged. Civilians were killed. Civilian property was, was damaged and destroyed without military necessity per se in this incident. But the context and the, the background facts were really critical here. Uh, and so I, I offer that as, as food for thought. I want to talk just in, in the last uh, five or so minutes about some specific examples in Ukraine that, that will exemplify some of the principles that we've been talking about here today. Uh, the first is uh, this image here. Uh, this is a, a digital mock-up, but this is, uh, we're going to talk about the, the Retroville shopping mall complex. This is on the outskirts of Kyiv. Uh, this was the complex, that same complex on 22 March after a massive Russian uh, artillery and missile strike against it. Uh, a lot of the same uh, sort of initial reaction out of this. Some civilians uh, died in this strike. It was uh, absolutely devastating to this, uh, this bit of civilian property during the early days of the war. What came out after that was uh, Russia released some drone footage purporting to show uh, the site of the, uh, of the shopping mall. So the ghostly buildings there uh, allegedly are, are images of that shopping mall from above. The red boxes there are really critical. Those are what the uh, Russians highlighted there. Uh, and that's what I want to focus in on here. So Russians alleged that uh, they had UAV footage of uh, Ukrainian BM-21 Grad missile launchers uh, operating, firing from uh, the, the grounds of this shopping mall, using the shopping mall, uh, the, the area around it, in and around it as a resupply point to reload. So that's just a bit about the grad, uh, that, that BM-21. So it, uh, it's a multiple rocket launch system, can rapidly fire missiles, and it's got a pretty decent range on it. Uh, the, the Russians claim that they, they had necessity to, to attack this military target. Uh, I don't know whether the attack was conducted while any, any rockets were being fired by BM-21s. Uh, that's not all that relevant under the circumstances, but, I illustrate that uh, because it, it, it's a proportionality test, right? These are, this, this uh, BM-21 is undoubtedly by its nature a military target. Uh, that facility, the, the mall is not, but if it's being used as a resupply point, as a launch point uh, for uh, these rocket launchers to, to hit, strike uh, enemy targets, uh, that can shift the calculus there. And, and it comes down to our proportionality question. I don't have an answer for you as to, to whether proportionality was appropriate. There are a lot of factors in there, just like our opening hypothetical that we just don't know as we sit here today. This is the Donetsk uh, Regional Drama Theater, uh, dates back to 1887. This is a, a, a historical building uh, out east. Donetsk is one of the breakaway provinces that, uh, that still remains largely in Russian control. Uh, this was the, uh, what the facility or that, that, uh, center looked like on 15 March, the writing and the front and the back of the building there said children, it was meant to be seen by air. Uh, this was a, a, shelter place for hundreds of Ukrainian civilians, uh, including children. This is, uh, that same building on 16 March. It was hit by an airstrike. A number of civilians were killed and injured, uh, same, uh, the same questions about distinction, uh, the, the, the fact that this was cultural property, something that was 
uh, different than, uh, you know, maybe your, your average Walmart in town. This is a historical building that held a lot of significance for this area and thus is afforded uh, sort of additional protection. How is this be building being used beyond what we know? I, I have no clue. On its face, it appears to be a really, uh, it, it's a horrific loss of life no matter what, but it opens up those questions about distinction, about proportionality uh, and, and, and the like with massive consequences. Uh, in, the, in the opening days of the war, we saw a lot of Ukrainian civilians mobilize uh, or, or take up arms spontaneously against Russian soldiers. The fact that this is an interna international armed conflict had impact on, on some of those citizens. Some of those citizens got captured. So questions about uh, their, their rights and the protections that they're afforded once they're in Russian hands are really critical. Uh, as a civilian, do you have the ability to take up arms? What, what protections does IHL offer you? Uh, in that, uh, in those circumstances, I mentioned the the business of dis distinction. They the country conducted a, a mass sort of mobilization, uh, a sort of a call to arms, um, of which many Ukrainian citizens uh, answered. They had an obligation now being part of the Ukrainian armed forces to whether it was the territorial defense force that was stood up or uh, the, the foreign legion, which we'll touch on in a second. To distinguish themselves. So you see the same sort of stuff we talked about earlier, openly carrying arms, uniforms, distinguish, uh, distinctive insignia, or emblems, uh, like the shoulder patches here. Uh, they have that obligation, even if they're not a career soldier, to, to distinguish themselves on the battlefield. Foreign fighters have been a uh, big issue here. We, uh, from, from both sides, we have uh, folks that have come from overseas and other countries uh, to fight on both sides of the conflict. This is Malcolm Nance. He's an MSNBC contributor. Uh, probably tune in and see him once in a while. He's in Ukraine fighting. He's been a, a contractor there. But uh, what happens to him? What happens to somebody like Malcolm Nance if he's captured on the battlefield? He's an American uh, fighting over there. And in fact, this was the case for uh, Alex and Andy here. These are two former uh, U.S. service members who were captured by Russian forces. They had actually gone over to Ukraine uh, as the war broke out and joined uh, the Ukrainian Foreign Legion, which was stood up. Ukraine's position was that uh, that Foreign Legion was made an official part of its armed forces, and therefore all the members of it, like Alex and Andy, were entitled to POW protections, prisoner of war protections, when they were captured. Uh, Russians disagreed. Russians uh, accused Alex and Andy and, and some like him of being mercenaries, uh, guns for hire, uh, folks that are not entitled to the same protections uh, as other uh, members of the Ukrainian armed forces. Fortunately, those, these two were released um, relatively recently, but I would encourage you to go look up their stories. They've given uh, pretty extensive and, and uh, heartbreaking interviews about their experiences there. It really sheds a light on, on exactly what somebody like this goes through and the, the, how critical it is, uh, how somebody like this is assessed, uh, how somebody like this is, is uh, considered in terms of their status, their role. Mercenaries are a big deal. We, you hear a lot about the, the Wagner group and, and uh, sort of these, these fighters for hire. Mercenaries are, are distinguished under IHL uh, you know, in, in large part by their receipt of money they're paid not just paid because normal soldiers get paid. You get a paycheck when, when you're in the military, but these are fighters who are paid far above and beyond what a normal soldier might be, might expect to be paid uh, if, if they were a member of uh, armed forces to a party of the armed conflict. Uh, critically here, I, I reference this because mercenaries if captured uh, don't carry the same protections. They're not considered POWs, prisoners of war. They're not considered members of the armed forces of a state. And so they, they're treated with a, a, a different degree of protections uh, than other fighters on the battlefield. Uh, prisoners of war have been uh, repeatedly at issue here on both sides. Uh, and uh, the ICRC continues to do really critical, important work uh, conducting visitations of detainees on uh, prisoners of war on both sides of the conflict to ensure that their rights uh, as to, to humane treatment are being, uh, are being observed. I would note that prisoners of war is a status that's meant to keep you off the battlefield from being a fighter. It's not a punitive status, meaning you're not punished for fighting. So when the armed conflict ends, whenever that is, uh, POWs in Ukraine uh, legally must be uh, repatriated, must be released uh, at the end of the conflict. 
Uh, I really don't, we're, we're about out of time here, so I won't touch on accountability other than to say that, that this is going to be a long process on, on both sides. Uh, there are a number, uh, thousands upon thousands of alleged IHL violations currently under investigation by Russian authorities, by Ukrainian authorities, by international authorities like the International Criminal Court. That process is going to take a long time to wind out, not unlike situations in our, our criminal justice system. It, uh, a, a, a crime, uh, the moment from a, or the timeline from when a crime is committed to when uh, you, you get a final judgment in a case is often not very quick. Uh, there's a, a lot involved in that and the complexities of an armed conflict and post-conflict accountability are, are no different. Christian, I don't know if we have any uh, questions or uh, discussion just in the last uh, minute or two here, uh, but feel free to pitch them my way. Um, yeah, one one second. Uh, let me. I'm reading the the one question that's in the Q and A. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll just read it aloud. In regards to the appropriate use for force on civilian locations. If it is being used by a military, is it not the responsibility of both parties to be responsible for civilian locations in life? For example, when speaking about the mall, if it were the case that this was being used for reloading, wouldn't another question be why would the U Ukraine in this instance put their civilians in danger and would they be held accountable um, for misusing that, uh, I guess, is the question. Yeah, so th that is a great question. And there, there is responsibility in, in sort of differing levels that flows on both sides of this. Uh, I, we, we don't know what happened at Retroville. I have no idea whether Ukraine, uh, A, I don't know whether the, the Russian position with that UAV footage is authentic and accurate. But assuming that it is, we don't know what Ukraine did in terms of uh, precautions taken to uh, to evacuate civilians. You would like to think that the military would take uh, precautions in that instance, but this was a dynamic situation. They're, uh, they're responding to an invasion that is rapidly unfolding, and they're desperate to, to uh, keep Kyiv in the hands of, of Ukrainians and prevent it from falling to, uh, to Russians. So uh, there's not a, an IHL violation per se in terms of uh, a friendly force warning or not warning their population about their use of uh, a particular area for uh, for military purposes, but sort of at a baseline, you would expect and hope uh, that some effort would be made there. That exigency plays a role, though. Sometimes it's just it's just not uh, not feasible. Now, the business of using civilian objects to uh, to attack from that can be unlawful. Uh, it, it really is, is factually dependent, uh, circumstantially dependent on what's happening here. I would say Retroville uh, doesn't cross that line, probably if we're talking about BMPs sitting in a parking lot uh, firing. What you don't want to see is uh, use of those or attempted use of those civilian locations, the civilian populace as a shield from attack. In other words, hey, you can hit us, but you're going to have to kill all of these innocent people either. That would be wrong, but we don't have enough facts here to, to make a call on that. Okay. What we'll do, Christian, I hope you were able to, to answer questions. I, we, we went the full time, which is absolutely what we were aiming to. So if you have other questions, uh, we run a, a robust program at the national headquarters level, but also a nationwide, arguably a global program involving our volunteers overseas uh, that, that aim to educate the American public. We have a great line of pop culture events that we do at the NHQ level where we use movie and TV shows to, to help illustrate and teach about key principles of IHL, Star Wars, Harry Potter. Uh, we'll be doing Indiana Jones early next year. We just did Stranger Things on, on Halloween. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. There are opportunities for you to get involved, uh, to, to come in. I don't care if you don't have any experiences uh, in the in the in the law at all, you don't have to be an attorney. You don't have to have any experience in IHL to become an IHL volunteer to get certified as an IHL instructor on our adult side, the dissemination program to go out there and make an impact in your community uh, to include teaching CLEs of your very own, or on the youth side with our youth action campaign, getting involved with those uh, 13 to 23 year olds who are learning about IHL uh, with the assistance of, of uh, YAC advisors, we call them, 
and uh, working to, to craft their own dissemination programs in their communities, around the dinner table, at their schools, and making a real impact. Last year alone, we reached reach more than 60,000 Americans with in-person activities uh, to include virtual activities uh, like this webinar. We reached more than 250,000 people via social media impressions, separate and apart from that. So we are making a real defined impact, and you can be a part of that impact uh, with whatever time you're able and willing to give and without the need for, for any experience or prior knowledge, we will provide that to you. We will get you trained up and get you to be knowledgeable uh, and well-versed in this area. Here is our contact information, myself, Christian, and Larissa. We are always happy to field any questions. Uh, please, please, for those uh, who are seeking CLE credit, if you are in Illinois, look out for that post-event uh, response or the, the form. If you're in another jurisdiction and you intend to apply or submit this for CLE credit, I'd be an hour of substantive credit. Please email one of us, reach out to us, and uh, let us know, and we can help facilitate that in any way possible to include confirming your attendance for the hour. I want to thank all of you for coming out and taking time out of your busy day. I wish everyone uh, happy holidays. If you're watching this on a recording, thank you for, for picking this up and watching this. And I hope that uh, it encourages you to go out and help educate those in your community about IHL and the protections that it offers. Thanks and have a great day.